Greetings. This is Atma Boda. Today is December 19th, 2021 at 6 p.m. The title of today's podcast is Ratiating Love Should Just Be the Natural Mode of Living. Not loving should be the rare thing to experience. And this just shows how far we have fallen as a species. In my experience of love, that's just the natural state of what everyone should be in. You should be feeling love all the time. That's the beautiful thing about love. And that's what makes it such a wonderful experience because it is something that you can experience all the time. Unlike sex, whereby you have an orgasm and then that's it, it's, it's over. With love, it never ends. At least that is the ideal state of love, of unconditional love, is when it never ends. It's this fire that's in your heart and you feel it mm, so deeply. And it's something that everybody wants. Yet in this day and age, people are afraid to even say the word love half the time. And also it's like, in ages past, we didn't need to use these words to say, oh, I love you, man, or I love you. It's like, yes, we would say them occasionally, but we would feel love all the time. It's like we wouldn't have to say it because the love was already there. It's like you've already felt that, that unity. And that's the thing about love. It's everywhere. Animals have it. Your dog has it. Your cat has it. The birds in the trees have it. The plants have it. Love is a universal force, a life energy that pervades the universe. However, it's different from universal truth, as we talked about in other podcasts, in that it's a receptive force. It's a gentle force. It's a force that can be shared, and it's a force that makes us all not the same. How do I say this? It, it's, it's a shared experience. It's what can connect us and keep us humble. It's like when we're all feeling this loving energy, it's, one person isn't above another person and another person isn't below another person. It's like we are this harmonious family together. And that is what's so beautiful about love. It comes from the heart and it, it unites us. And that's what my vision at least is for the future to have everyone be able to feel this love all the time and to not be divided by what race you have or what sex you are what religion you are, what culture you are, what nationality you are. I mean, there's so many ways that society tries to divide us. But in actual fact, we all are united by the fact that we're all human. And as humans, we all have this love, this deeper love that can be shared and experienced. It can be given, it can be received. And there's this myth that's been perpetrated throughout society that there is a limited supply of love, that there's a scarcity, that in order to have love, you need to make money. You need to have a good job. You need to have a house. You need to have a car. You need to have all of these things. You need to be respected. You need to have friends in high places. You need to perform a certain way. And that's what we call conditional love. I mean, that's not unconditional love. That's conditional love. That means you're not getting love unless you jump through hoops to get it. And that's not what freedom is about. That's not what liberation is about. That's not what love is about. So what is love? Love is that fire that can burn in your heart. There's that old expression, fall in love. What does that mean, fall in love? That means you fall from your mind into your heart. 
That is what falling in love is all about. I mean, for me personally, my enlightenment experience didn't happen when my heart opened because my mind was too strong. You know, I don't want to say too strong. It sounds, how do I say? My, my mind craved something that my heart couldn't give me. And that's where I went on the quest to find this ultimate truth because my mind needed that nectar, that amrita, that ambrosia. It's like when you have a certain level of mind, it's like it's not enough just to have your heart. It's like, yes, heart is wonderful, but heart is something that everybody has. And it's, it's not what makes you necessarily unique as an individual. I mean, it's part of that. It, it part of your heart does make you unique, but you are, your mind is also important. That's an important aspect of your personality. How, what level of intelligence you have, what ideas you have, how well you can innovate and problem solve and find a direction into your, in your life that is fulfilling. And yes, people say, oh, follow your heart. And I agree. Following your heart is better than following your desire. Of course, you want to. And people say, well, what about your heart's desire? It's like, well, that's different. You know, an internal motivation is different from an external desire. And that's sometimes difficult to discern the difference between the two. But that's where you want to come from. You want to come from a place whereby you have an internal motivation, whether it be from what your heart wants to do or whether it be what your higher inspiration in your mind, well, not in your mind, but through your mind, you can focus your mind and receive higher inspiration from a higher source. So that is what life is about, is about experiencing love from the deepest place and also receiving inspirations from the highest place. And when you have the highest and the deepest, then there really is nothing else but to celebrate life and to manifest in your lifetime the dreams and ambitions that you have. As far as I'm concerned, my ambition is very simple. I want as many people to love each other and to experience love and truth as possible. And that may sound hmm, overly optimistic or too noble or, but that's sincere. That's sincere. What I want. It's not about me. It's not about, you know, I'll tell you a story. When I was a boy, to, to just say it straight out, I, at one point, I was an atheist. I'm talking when I was like, I think I was maybe 10 or 11. I was an atheist. I didn't believe in God. And yet, I was forced by my family to go to church every Sunday. And I would go to church and I would sit in those pews at church and I would watch people singing and raising up their hands and praising God, and I thought to myself, God doesn't exist because if God really existed, God wouldn't want to be worshipped this way. Or if God needed some kind of worship, then that would not be a God that I'd want to believe in. Because even at an early age, I knew intuitively that if a God needed to be worshiped, that God is not really powerful. It can't exist without worship. It has a weakness. Or even in the fact that it would need worship or think that it needs worship is a weakness because it's following like a top down hierarchy, which means that there's a tyrannical aspect to a deity if it 
did require worship. That's like a conformity. And not only does it require worship through this conformity, but it's a blind belief. It's not even an evidence-based belief or a, a belief that is reached through rationality and logic deduction. Now, my views on God changed, though. It changed after I moved out and I became more independent. And how, it became, how I became more independent was I picked up this book at one point called Huna, A Beginner's Guide by Enid Hoffman. I never will forget that book. But it basically teaches that there are three selves. There's a lower self. There's a middle self. And then there's a higher self. And you can, uh, um, you can relate these lower, middle, and higher self to some psychological terms. Like the lower self would be your subconscious. The middle self would be your conscious mind. And then the higher self would be your superconscious. And what this book laid out was that in order to access the superconsciousness, you can only do that by unconditionally loving this lower self, your subconscious. And it taught that this subconscious is like a child within. It only accepts things literally. And it, and it, in fact, it gets it confused. So every time you beat up on yourself and you say, oh, you're so stupid. Even if your conscious mind shrugs off statements like that, there's a part of you that takes everything literally like a small child. And so that child within that one of the first things they teach in this book is you name this child within a special secret name that only you know. And then every day you provide it with affirmations like I love you unconditionally and then you use the special name and you tell the child within that unless you use this special name, you're not talking to it. So every time you would say something accidentally that could be like, oh, I'm so stupid or I'm dumb or why did you do this? You know, like sometimes we can beat ourselves up. But you make sure that the subconscious, that lower self doesn't take it literally. That it's only if you're speaking to it using that special name that it uh, takes it seriously. So then by every day um, practicing, oh, I love you unconditionally. Um, I, you're so awesome. You are amazing. And giving these self affirmations on a daily basis. One thing I noticed is that I started to develop this glowing, loving feeling in my heart. And to me, it was amazing because I never really felt this love before. I think that was the first time in my life that I could really understand what love was. All of my years attending as a child church and even through um, being raised by my father and mother, etc. I never really felt that love to such a degree where I could say, oh, so that what that is what love means. But by doing this practice, that's how I first experienced love. And I remember there's this one thing that happened that's quite interesting. I was working at a place at the time and one of my coworkers, I think I was probably like, what the, how old was I? Like maybe 18 years old, 17, 18 years old, something like that. Yeah. Anyway, I was, I was working at this place and actually, no, how, how old was I? Maybe I was 19. Somehow. <laughs> anyway, it, it was young. It was a number of years ago, but there's this lady working. one of my coworkers. She was crying and in pain and she was grabbing hold of her foot. And then out of concern and compassion, I just reached over and I touched her. And then she looked up at me and she said, my pain is just totally gone. It just went away. And she said, I thought I was the only one that could do that. It turned out that she was a healer as well. And 
so so this was my first evidence that there was something more than what science regards as possible it was an example of a small little miracle and the reason I brought up that story is because that is the power of unconditional love it has the power to take away pain there is something to that that it's more than just an emotion it's more than just endorphins in your brain there is no chemical cocktail of serotonin and or whatever that's going to give you the feeling of love if they could they would they would they would have a prescription medication called you know la vitra or some some, some some drug that would have the word love you know in it and that they would it psychiatrists would praise it all across the world it's like finally we found love here you can have a bottle of love go ahead we'll fill your prescriptions <laughs> but they can't you know pharmacology is it's see the thing about love is it's not something that can be synthesized it's not they don't understand love they think it's uh, in fact science today they they still think it's a, a mental um a mental thing that somehow it's created in your mind but actually it's not it's created in your heart and you might people might ask well how can you prove that you're not a scientist it's like well once you've crossed that barrier of illumination i mean well before you cross that barrier of, of illumination it becomes very very obvious where the source of love is i mean anyone who's significantly made progress on their spiritual path they know where love comes from it comes from the heart of course and um, what people don't realize yet though the mind does have a very important role in spiritual circles people tend to downplay the mind these days for some reason but the mind also is extremely important it, it, it's the gateway to objective truth without the mind you can't even experience objective truth it's what sets humanity apart as a species animals don't have that ability to experience objective truth but let's keep this on love so throughout this entire podcast i've been feeling love and it's great love is something that doesn't need a reason okay you don't need a reason <laughs> to feel love i mean that's what unconditional love is about it's like a baseline experience of consciousness whereby if you are experiencing love that's what you should be doing all of the time and it's there's the scarcity consciousness that's up and up. i'll talk about this in the future but from an early age you know we're conditioned as children to progress into adulthood and to get the child out of us but when we're children that's when we have that pure spontaneity that's when we are loving beings supposedly even though i don't remember that aspect too clearly with the love aspect but i do know that it's spontaneous and that spontaneity and that sense of wonder that we have as children that's something that we should cherish as adults why would we not want that childlike quality why all of a sudden as adults we get these negative pessimistic attitudes and think we know so much more it's like no the more you know the less you know the wise person realizes that you got to keep an open mind it's like don't become rigid in your beliefs be fluid have an adaptive mind that's what a child has right and more of an adaptive mind and that is what keeps us young anyway this uh is already already finished no more time so this is Atma Bodha signing off and this has been great and until tomorrow you have a wonderful day don't forget divinity.com you can reach me there